Welcome to Fifth Dimensional Leadership. Today, yet another fascinating guest. I love what I do because this woman is so interesting. She is a TEDx speaker, a board member, a former vice president at IBM, and an angel investor. That's really just the half of it. She started her career as a software engineer and then moved into sales and sales leadership, leading global teams to deliver over a billion dollars in annual revenues and serving as a key decision maker in hiring and promoting hundreds of professionals. At the peak of her career, she left IBM to share her strategies with other women to accelerate their career success. Through mentoring thousands of women, speaking at corporations, colleges, and conferences globally, she realized that women are still struggling with the same challenges she faced during her career. Don't I know? They are ambitious and searching for a blueprint to show their worth and rise up to the leadership ranks. These women inspired Shalmina Babai Abji to write her book, Show Your Worth, Eight Intentional Strategies for Women to Emerge as Leaders at Work. Shalmina, welcome to Fifth Dimensional Leadership. So glad to have you. It is such an honor to be here, Jenny. Thank you for having me. Oh, well, when you and I have known each other for a while, I'm always, yeah. uh, you know, really forthcoming about some of my prior relationships. And I knew your husband even before because he was a candidate and a placement of mine when I was doing executive search. That's right. And when you told me you were writing a book, I thought, okay, can't wait until that comes out and got to have you on the show when it just came out. I'm so excited to hear about it. But before we get into that, I always want to hear about you because you have such an amazing story that I want you to share with our audience. Let me just start off because here's what I know about you. You grew up in Tanzania and were the first in your family to graduate college and went on to become one of the highest ranking women of color at IBM. And you were a single mother of two young children in the early years. I just want to know where all that came from. That's a lot. I just kind of told the highlights, some of the highlights of your past. Fill in the gaps. Yeah. Um, I love talking about where I come from because I so strongly identify myself with where I come from. Uh, it's really what gives me the roots. It, it keeps me ground, grounded no matter what. Um, so, Jenny, yes, I grew up. Uh, in Tanzania, very humble beginnings. And really my drive, the first time I was driven to achieve anything was in third grade when I had come home with a report card that was riddled with red ink. I had ranked 27 out of 30 in a class, yes. And uh, because, you know, prior to that, I used to go to school to play and to have fun. And my parents were living in a small town and I was living with my maternal grandmother who loved me sometimes to a fault. So if I'm doing homework at night, she'll say, go to sleep, you know, you're gonna get tired. And so, um, and she meant well, she, mm -hmm. she just loved me. But uh, that was her way of showing her love. But then in third grade, my parents moved back to Mwanza and I come home with a report card and I thrust it into the hands of my mom. You know, Jenny, my mom um, you used to work really hard. Um, she had fourth grade education, my dad, sixth grade, and um, she used her talent of cooking to supplement my father's income. And so she was frying what in Swahili, the language of Tanzania is called vitumbua. These are rice cakes that she made to sell around town. And so, you know, she had sweat dripping down her face. She was all red and I come home and I show her this report card, like literally thrust it in her hands. It's riddled with red ink and she starts crying. And, you know, the third grade Shalmina was innocent. She was naive. She's looking at her mom. And I asked her mom, why are you crying? Mm. And she said, you know, I work so hard to educate you. And you've come home with every single grade in A. That's how they indicated that you had failed. And I looked at her and I said, what? You didn't tell me you wanted me to pass. 
<laughs> and I and I was serious, and yeah. I it was I I really had no expectations set, right? And so that was the day I decided I was going to get good grades to make my mom happy. That was it was really as simple as that. Mm-hmm. My definition of success was not to have red on my report card, and to make my mom happy. You know, as I grew up, Jenny, I watched our family from hand to mouth. You know, we we were not we had roof over our head the four brothers and sisters lived in you know shared a bedroom we always had love laughter safety security so i don't want to paint this picture like you know i was really poor and Mm -hmm. i actually had a really good childhood as far as i'm concerned Mm -hmm. and everyone else that i associated with were in the same socioeconomic class so it never occurred to me that i was poor or anything like that but Mm -hmm. Watching my parents struggle, because I had started getting good grades in class, because you know I wanted to keep my mom happy, and and you know how that works. Um, once I started doing well, then that success became a motivation itself, right? So by the time I was in high school, I started thinking that you know I can get good grades in class. I'm smart. I work hard. Maybe I could go to college. So that became a drive to lift my family out of poverty. Mm-hmm. became a drive. So that sent me to India and that brought me to the US. And um, Jenny, I worked 35, 40 hours a week, putting myself through college. But to me, that was an opportunity because I saw my mom work so hard of and course. she always, she considered work to be an opportunity, never a burden. You know, she said, I'm fortunate that I can cook and I can use that money to raise you. And so, yeah, my my drive has come from different sources Mm -hmm. at different points in my career. Um, When I started my career, I wanted to support my family. Then I became pregnant with my first child. I wanted to buy a home in which to raise her, and that became a motivation. When I became single, as you indicated, when the kids were two and four, to provide for them became my drive. Um, Now, to help women succeed in their career is how I'm driven. So it's been it's been different at different phases in my in my life. Yeah, I'm I'm curious. Um, When you talk about this, I I wonder because I you know a lot of women struggle with not with being sometimes too selfless, right? So as you're describing, you did it for your mother, you did it. Was there any time when you were doing it just for you? Was that embedded in there somewhere? So great question. Um, it, when I became a single mom with, with two children, I... I was a sales leader leading a team of 10 people and I had a $120 million quota. Um, And I was completely overwhelmed to a point where I was about to give up my sales leadership role because I couldn't give up my children. And I felt like I couldn't do it all. Um, But giving that that sales leadership role that I had worked so hard for my entire life didn't sit well with me. Mm -hmm. So at that point, I realized that in order for me to thrive, both in my career and my life, I had to first take care of myself. Got it. And that was the only way I was going to be able to bring my full self to my career and to my children. Mm -hmm. So, you know, you could call that, that it was selfish, but not really. Uh, Because I realized that in taking care of myself, I was actually able to take care of everyone else better. And so I am driven to have an impact on others. I am driven to increase my sphere of influence um, Mm -hmm. and to do well. but not really for myself in a way i'm driven to be a better person i'm driven to maximize my my potential but always the why is 
to accomplish something where I am having an impact and I'm increasing my influence and I'm taking care of my loved ones. And is that, is it fair to call that a level of satisfaction? Right? One, yeah. 100%. <laughs> yeah. Oh my God, 100%. Yeah. Because really you know our our success is what's externally visible and then what's internally rewarding and really for us women i haven't yet met a woman who is completely driven by the external visible success right there is always a balance there is a combination of this this reward that comes from within mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. this satisfaction that comes from within and the achievement, which is visible from the outside. Right. Yeah. Thank you for that. I think it's important to call out for people because I think your identity can, can get lost sometimes in a job, men and women, it doesn't matter, but that's to me a very slippery slope. I agree. Yeah. Yeah. So, because I tell you what, if I may, yeah, no matter what we do for a living, no matter how much we love our jobs, we're never just the perform the person doing the job. We are wives, we are mothers, we are daughters, we are sisters, we are caregivers. And we get energy from all of the above. Mm -hmm. And they give meaning to our lives, that it enriches our life. And so, and we bring that energy from one place to another, by the way. And so one without the other, in my opinion, would ring hollow. I agree, for sure. So now, when did you consider yourself a leader? I mean, did, did when did you think, I'll ask it this way, because sometimes you don't. <laughs> I know, I don't know that I always did, but, but when do you think others recognized you as a leader? <laughs> You know, Ginny, um, I'll give you the answer and then I'll tell you what the answer should have been. And that's what I'm trying to teach women today. So I did not see myself as a leader until mm -hmm. I was 31 years old. Mm -hmm. um, I really should have seen myself as a leader in third grade when I changed my focus to achieve a different outcome. I, I should have seen myself as a leader when even though no one in my family had been to college, there was no education past 10th grade in the town in which I grew up. I decided I was gonna pursue a college degree. I should have seen myself as a leader, mm -hmm. but I didn't. Mm -hmm. um, I came, when I joined the workforce in the United States, you know, your mind plays tricks with you. There was no one in the leadership ranks that looked like me, that spoke like me. Uh, frankly, in my case, with my first job, Jenny, there was no one who looked like me anywhere, mm -hmm. let alone the leadership ranks. And so it was hard for me to see myself as a leader. And in every role that I had, there was no one that looked like me, no one that spoke like me. Uh, most of them were more experienced, more educated, came from better socioeconomic backgrounds. But it was only when I joined sales which, you know, my degrees are in computer science and mathematics. So mm -hmm. I was completely pushed to the edge of my competence. I was a fish outside, out of the water. And, um, but when I excelled in sales, that's when I started thinking I could be a sales leader. That Let was the first. Something. I want to, I'm sorry to cut you off, but I want to ask you something because um, early when I started doing these, these podcasts, I spoke to to someone else, a woman named Shelly Archambault, whom you might have heard of, who also was at IBM back in the day. Yeah. And uh, what came to mind for me, and when she was talking is, sales drives IBM, Yeah. right? Yeah. It's a function that is at the yeah. heart of their yeah. business. Yeah. So was it a, a strategy for you to move into that? Or were you nudged into that <laughs> because someone saw that you might uh, advance your your capabilities by moving into that function so you're gonna laugh um when i became pregnant with sophia i decided that i wanted to buy a house for her uh, for her to grow up in you know and neither my ex-husband nor i n no one in our family had ever owned a house before so sure. so this this desire to buy a house was also leadership but i didn't see it that way um 
And I looked around and I saw that it was the salespeople that were getting the commissions. They were, they were getting these big awards. And so I said, sign me up, you know? And so, so I joined sales motivated to make more money. Mm-hmm. But sales ended up becoming the platform in which I excelled. Beautiful. It's about numbers. I delivered on those numbers. Mm-hmm. And when I excelled, that was the first time I realized that it doesn't matter that there's no one that looks like me is doing it. I can do it because I just excelled in a role in which I felt completely outside my comfort zone. Yeah. And when I decided to become a sales leader, I started taking the steps. I started making the choices, the intentional choices to get me to become a sales leader. Mm -hmm. That's when I started actually thinking of myself as a leader, not when I got the title, but when I made a decision to become a sales leader, leader, I started looking around how do the sales leaders behave? Who are the sales leader I respect and admire? I started learning from them. I started emulating them. Um, so that was the first time I saw myself as a leader. When were when did people start seeing me as a leader? Frankly, I don't know. I, you know, people have come to me for my advice since I was in elementary school, they would come for teach me how to solve this math problem or, um, but I don't know if they view, viewed me as a leader. Um, I, I do know that even after I had a sales leader title, Jenny, there were people who questioned my capabilities, who doubted, and they didn't view me as a sales leader. I could tell from the way mm-hmm. They behaved with me, but by then I didn't let it bother me. By then I was so sure of my own capabilities that I had learned that I am going to demonstrate my capability and I'm going to educate them and show them that, yes, I am a leader. So everyone, you know, each person decided when they were going to view me as a leader. Um, Initially it bothered me, but later on it didn't. Yeah, you got over it. It's, yeah, uh, I got over it. <laughs> I mean, it's, uh, it's what I think, you know, a lot of people today call that imposter syndrome thing where you're doubting yourself and questioning and comparing yourself to everyone. And I mean, I've done it. I, I did it in my 30s, 20s and 30s for sure. You, I'm sure you recall, you've alluded to some of those times, but how did you consciously overcome it? Was it just this decision to say, screw it, I... I I got my eye on the ball. I'm going to go in that direction, come what may. You know, just making that decision was not enough. I had to actually learn. So mm-hmm. so let, let, let's, appro- let's talk about this, this subject, subject of imposter syndrome. You know, it's loosely defined as someone doubting their capabilities right. and thinking they're a fraud. Yep. And in my mind, these are two very different and distinct traits. I have doubted my capabilities several times in my career. I have never felt like I'm a fraud. And let me let me explain this. This is why the term fake it until you make it does not resonate with me. The term trust yourself to learn and grow until you make it resonates with me. And the reason I say this, Jenny, is that the story I tell myself about myself has been the most important narrative. It doesn't matter what anyone else thinks. I needed to get that private victory that I am capable. And so if I had to tell myself that I need to fake something, I am essentially giving myself a message that I'm not good enough. Mm-hmm. And if I gave myself that message, I would act not good enough. Now, maybe for some people, faking it motivates them, but it doesn't work for me. I need to always give myself a message that you are good enough the way you are, and you have the capability to learn and grow, to become what you want to become. Yeah. So, but but doubting my capabilities um, 
and and making a decision not to was not just a, a switch that I turned on and yeah. and voila it happened no it did not let me share a story with you the first time i entered corporate america you know jenny i was on a student visa in the united states and so 99.9% of the companies wouldn't give an interview me because i didn't have the right visa status mm -hmm. there was just one company a technology startup company in St. Paul, Minnesota, who interviewed me and gave me a job. I got my degree in computer science from a very small university, University in Wisconsin, La Crosse. And when I entered the workforce, initially I was elated. You know, Ginny, the $27,000 that they were willing to pay me was more money than my parents could make in 10 years. It, you know, for me, that was my passport out of poverty. I was, I had arrived, I had made it. Here I am with a spring in my step and very, very grateful for this opportunity because you see where I come from, Jenny, there are so many women who are way smarter than I am, who work way harder than I do, but they're not given the opportunities that I did. Sure. You were grateful. So yeah. I was grateful, mm -hmm. spring in my step, I go into work. But memo after memo, meetings after meetings, I realize no one here looks like me. Everyone has more experience than I do. Everyone has been to more credentialed universities than I do. Mm -hmm. They have masters, they have PhDs, some from Ivy League colleges. And I started undermining myself. I started thinking, what value am I going to contribute? Yeah, I went through what the same I, thing when I got right? to business school. Same thing. Yeah. What What do I know that they don't already know? Mm -hmm. But here's the thing, Jenny. I was stuck between a rock and a hard place. Because in 12 months, if I didn't figure out a way to contribute unique value, not just value, unique value, then my company would not extend my visa. Right. And by law, they were required to hire someone else to do my job. Mm -hmm. So so here I am undermining my capabilities, so I'm afraid to speak up. I'm afraid to speak up in meetings because I'm thinking if I say something, I might state the obvious. I might sound stupid. They might realize that they shouldn't have hired me because they were the only company that hired me. They might even fire me. I'd have to go back. But then, as luck would have it, I was sitting in a meeting one Tuesday afternoon, and I shared this in my book. Jenny, I also have a TEDx talk mm -hmm. where I share this with women because I work with so many women. Like you said, in business school, you were undermining yourself. Mm -hmm. I work with women who are here as refugees, first-generation immigrants, first people to go to college, going to community college, they are, of course, undermining themselves. Yeah. They are afraid to speak up. But here's the thing. If you don't learn to speak up, people will never know how smart you are. That's right. Right? Yeah. And so one fine Tuesday, I'm sitting in a meeting, and we have this problem of testing a piece of software, and I have this idea. I, I, it was such a great idea. I, I'm jumping up and down in my head, wanting to speak up and, and state my idea. But my voice of fear, loud, don't say anything. You know, my voice of fear is just trying to protect me. It's doing its job. But it's telling me, don't say anything. Mm -hmm. They're going to find out you don't know what you're doing. And someone stated that exact idea. And it caught fire. He was getting applauses, pats on his back, great job. What a unique idea. When I heard that word unique idea, I'm thinking, oh my God, Shalmina, that could have been your unique idea. I went into the bathroom. I looked at myself in the mirror. I chastised myself. You should have spoken up. That could have been your idea. You could have created unique value. They would have got the visa for you to stay. Your family would have never been poor again. And this, this mind of mine was going insane. Mm -hmm. It's all in my head. 
Yeah. It's my own mental chatter telling me not to speak up. And then I recognize that these voices in my head, Jenny, they're my head. That's right. You got to move. You got to get, get out of it. I got it. I, I want, and I want to get onto the book. I'm really eager right? to get to start talking about the book. Was there more yeah. on that story? How did that end? You got your visa, obviously. Exactly. I learned to understand that that mental chatter that was sabotaging my career was a voice in my head that I could actually control. There you go. Just as I have the voice of fear, I also have the voice of courage. And you have to intentionally feed your voice of courage and find the courage and make it so loud to overcome your fear. Mm -hmm. That's how I started contributing unique value. That's how I stayed in the country. And I teach women how they can face their fear mm -hmm. and find their voice and contribute unique value, become essential to their organizations. Love it. All right. We're going to jump to the book because Let's do it. Um, I, I really want to hear about it. And I, I guess my first question to you is, well, I think you've actually kind of answered it. I think you have, which was, um, you know, why was writing this so important? And I think you just were describing from your own personal story how some of the revelations that you had, you wanted to make sure that some of these women maybe didn't have to go through some of the angst that you went through and that I probably yeah. went through. Yeah. 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 Yeah, and that was exactly it, Jenny. When I left IBM to help other women succeed because I wanted to pay back. I told you where I came from. I wanted to pay back. What I realized is women, even then, 30 years after I joined the workforce, are struggling with the same challenges. Yep. They have the same tailwinds that I had. Mm -hmm. And when I shared my insights with them and they came back to me and said that it worked for them, that's when I decided to increase my sphere of influence and my sphere of impact by writing a book. Beautiful. So in the book, you lead off with this discussion of the power of strategic intention. So describe what that is and why it's so important in this whole discussion. You know, Jenny, the cornerstone of my success was being intentional. But I also had to learn, what do I want to be intentional about? What's going to inform my intentions? And it was my strategies. Mm -hmm. Every business, and you're a businesswoman, you know that. Every woman, every business has a vision. And then they create strategies that they execute to achieve that vision. Our career is exactly the same way. Mm -hmm. You define what success means to you, and then you create strategies that you will intentionally execute to achieve that vision of success. So my strategies informed my intentions, and that's what I'm teaching the reader. Yeah, makes a lot of sense. You know, as I, I think back to my 20s, and I can remember being so happy to have gotten some of the jobs that I had at, you know, JLL and Prudential and then Spencer Stewart later, that was later in my 30s, but I can remember being so happy that I got the job. I wasn't always, in hindsight, intentional about what I wanted to learn and how I wanted to move through their organization. So I love this idea of intention. It's really essential. And it comes up again, the word intentional comes up because you've got a chapter in your book on intentional attention and intentional value creation. So tell us about those two elements. Yeah. yeah. So intentional value creation, I spoke about earlier mm -hmm. why I had to learn that, right? And, and you know, Jenny, the, one of the best advice I got in my career was always be asking what deserves your attention. And the way this came about, Jenny, as I said earlier, when I joined sales, I was completely out of water. Mm -hmm. I took every opportunity that was in my pipeline and I started pursuing every single opportunity that created an endless list of tasks for me. And I am going checking, checking, checking the task lists, working 60 hours a week and yet not making meaningful progress. So in my head, again, I started doubting my capabilities. I thought sales is not for me. 
Mm -hmm. And so I go into my very first review with my boss, a black gentleman, his name is Keith Elzia. And I said, Keith, I'm willing to work more hours because I must find a way to succeed in this role. You know, I wanted to buy that house, right? And Keith said something that changed my career. He said, it's not about working more hours. It's about understanding priorities. It's about understanding where to focus your attention. You see, we only have 24 hours in a day. Our time, our attention, our energy, these are all perishable. Mm -hmm. And we get to decide where we allocate our attention. And when you allocate it to your highest priorities, to what deserves your attention, you make meaningful progress every single day. And so I teach my reader, you know, success is not achieved one fine day. Mm -hmm. Success is achieved every single day, in every meeting, in every every interaction. And so when you are intentional about where you're going to focus your attention, you not only focus your attention on what's going to move you forward, you also don't get distracted by what's not going to move you forward. You intentionally choose to not allocate your attention to what depletes you of your energy, Mm -hmm. to what doesn't move you forward. And so I teach readers how to be intentional about their attention. And then I also teach readers about intentional value creation. Because remember, your corporation hires you for one thing and one thing only. And it's the value you create. When you intentionally create value in every meeting, in every interaction, in every single day, all this incremental value compounds and becomes transformational. Mm -hmm. You start contributing value that exceeds their expectation. And that's how you get visibility. You see, today, people talk about productivity, right? And Sundar Pichai at... CEO of your former employer, Google, Google. Mm -hmm. Mark Zuckerberg has been talking about it just last week in the last two weeks that our employees need to be more productive. And when you are intentional about where you focus your attention and contributing value, not only are you going to be productive, you are also going to exceed everyone's expectation. That's how we move ahead. That's how we get visibility. Yeah, here's the thing, though. I feel as though in some of the work environments that I've been in, they've been chaotic. And as a leader, I'm thinking about Google in particular. I think the tech sector kind of prides itself in some cases on being that way. And personally, I took the tack of with my teams. I said, listen, I'm you're not I don't do fire drills you're not going to pull me off my game. You know, whatever your fire drill is, there might be something that's mission critical, but I'll decide and I'll take the risk, (laughs) right? Because I want to keep myself, my attention and my team's attention focused. And so to me, that's an example of that, of being intentional. And which leads us to the next point around saying no to people. And say, no, I'm I'm not going to work on that right now for you. (laughs) Yes. <laughs> right? Yes. Because I yes. have this other thing that I know is a priority for me yes. and my team and yes. those that I might answer to. Yes, yes, yes. Good for you that you figured that out. Absolutely. Because so many women don't say no. Right. And then they get burnt out. Mm-hmm. In fact, for some, it impacts their mental health. Yep. And you see, Jenny, when you say no to something, you're actually saying yes to something that's a higher priority like you just did. And, and we as women, we, you know, we want to be liked by everyone and we want to be seen as a team player and we want to be seen as collaborators and all that is good, but we need to understand at what expense. That's right. We must understand the opportunity cost And we also must understand that saying no is essential to success. In fact, the more successful you become, 
the more no you will have to say because you will need to focus on your priorities. If you start getting distracted by the shiny object get, that's getting thrown at you every single day, um, and by the way, the shiny object will disappear. In two weeks, no one will even remember what it was, <laughs> and you just wasted a whole bunch of your attention on it. I've seen um, it. Right, you've seen it, we've all been there. And so in my book, I actually teach women how to say no, because I think it is an essential skill to succeed. And, but, but we must say no, we must learn how to say no so we don't alienate people, we don't sure. burn bridges, we don't upset people, because when we do it right, we actually deepen our relationships. And so what I'm teaching women is learn to be kind and firm. Be kind to the person you're saying no to, but be firm and be firm on your decision. Yeah. And, and this is something that is, is difficult, but the more you do it, the better you get at it. And then it gets to a point in time where people will start accepting your no, knowing that you're saying no because you're saying yes to a higher business priority. And this is not about you being selfish. This is about you doing the right thing for your corporation. And you should always be doing the right thing for your team, your boss, for your corporation. And learning how to say no is essential for you to do that. Yeah, I agree. I want to kind of jump to something else because we talked about as, as women, as women of color, um, there are additional stresses put on us in a corporate environment, have been throughout my career and probably yours as well. And it's interesting to me, to say the least, that most organizations continue to struggle with representation and inclusion in their workforces. And I guess I wanna know, what do you think is the biggest obstacle to that? And how do we overcome it? So as a salesperson, I look at it in terms of a pipeline. Um, and I, I'll, I'll talk about it both ways. Yeah. And this is my perspective. Mm -hmm. Okay. From the corporation's perspective, they, they need to focus on the entire pipeline, building and nurturing the pipeline. You see, Jenny, there is a lot of conversation around the glass ceiling. Mm -hmm. And there should be. However, there should also be a focus on building the pipeline. You see over 50% of the workforce are women. Mm -hmm. And yet at the first promotion level, by the way, we get more advanced degrees. Yep. We get degrees from better universities, even though I didn't. I have a bachelor's degree and I came from a small university. But in general, women get higher degrees from better universities as soon as they enter the corporate landscape. At the very first promotion level, depending on which report you're reading, 66, 67 are men, was mostly white men, and 33, 34 are women. We mm -hmm. drop off the leadership ladder at the very first promotion, yep. and then the problem gets compounded at each additional promotion. And by the time we get to the top, Jenny, 20% are women. And if you're a woman of color like you and I, it's 4%. And this, why is that? Why, yeah. why are we not getting those promotions and opportunities? Yes. And, and so this I is where... I have a very strong view. I want to hear yours. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> this is where I want to be the change maker. And you mm -hmm. are also trying to be the change maker. Us women need to take it upon ourselves that our success is up to us and that we cannot wait for everything to change for us to become successful. And this is what I am teaching our women. It would be very easy if the dinner table was set up and I'd show up for dinner. But for me, I have to go buy the ingredients, I have to cook the dinner and I have to eat the dinner. And that's okay, I'm gonna go do all that. Because if you and I and everyone else listening to this podcast and everyone listening and reading my book and applying the intentional strategies. If we refuse to opt out of the leadership pipeline 
then what will happen is we will continue to climb. And as we will have to be trailblazers. This is not easy. Jenny, what I'm asking women to do is not easy. What I did was not easy, but I defied the odds and so can that. Mm -hmm. And what I'm seeing and what curdles my blood is so many women, when they run into challenges, and they don't see people that look like them, they start opting out of the leadership pipeline. And I say, don't, because we will never ever fix the problem if we start opting out. We need to become the change we want to see. How and do so- we, What does that look like? What does refusing to opt out look like? Uh, and what it looks like is take these intentional strategies, stay in the pipeline, ask for that promotion, and, and listen, you will need to deserve that promotion. You will need to of earn course. that promotion because mm -hmm. people are not, when you look like you and I, no one's going to come tap on your shoulder and say, hey, Jenny, you did a great job. Let me make you a, let, let me give you a promotion. Mm -hmm. It's not going to happen until they see enough people that look like us in leadership pipeline. So when they visualize a leader, they visualize us. They're not doing that today, but we need to become that change. So you, you, intentionally allocate your attention, contribute value, intentionally grow, intentionally build the relationships, intentionally build a leadership brand before you even become a leader, mm -hmm. intentionally create a work-life balance. So you show up full, you show up yeah. to engage at your maximum capacity in every single meeting. People watch you contribute value in every single meeting. People watch you volunteering to take an assignment that pushes you outside your comfort zone. But I have to ask you, it, it, but is it after all that, I've still seen women who don't go as far as their white male or majority male counterparts. I'm not sure there's a meritocracy here. And I think to the extent there isn't, we have to acknowledge that. It doesn't mean we have to opt out, but I think we've got to be real with that because we can grind ourselves into the ground trying to address and, and meet with this norm that has been established. And in the eyes of some, we're never going to meet it. And I agree with you. In my book, I also tell women, after you have given it your best shot and it's not working, change. Yeah. Don't stay stuck. There are enough businesses today, Jenny, that are enlightened. They, there, is, there, is, there is research that has proven that when you have diversity in leadership roles, this is not about social good no. and philanthropy. No, this, this is, is about, <laughs> yes, women are driving results. That's it right. is smart business. So there mm -hmm. are enough businesses that have recognized that diversity women representation is good for the business right. go leave the company leave the people that are not going to appreciate you for what value you're bringing mm -hmm. don't ever be stuck yeah. you have one career one lifetime do not be stuck go somewhere else you may have to take a step backward to take two steps forward mm -hmm. it's okay your career is a long game right. and so Op, keep opting into that leadership pipeline. Be the Rosa Parks. Don't give up your seat. Take mm -hmm. your shot like Hamilton says, you know, in that movie. <laughs> I, I love it. I am not going to give up my shot. That's right. Do not give up your shot. Go where you can find success. And here's the thing, Jenny. If enough of us do that, if mm -hmm. enough of us blaze the trail, we will actually chip away at the negative stereotypes at yeah. the gender biases because we will be visible in all those leadership roles and and in the world the women of the world are watching us we owe it to them to become the change makers and the trailblazers so they don't have to deal with that negative stereotypes and gender biases that we had to deal with yeah you know i would add to that i i think we also need as women i'm back to this this theme about not necessarily emulating male behavior because that's we're we've been operating in in a construct that was never designed for us true that right so when we do move into these roles of these leadership roles these roles of influence i think we have to really 
intentionally seek to establish new constructs that actually work for all of us. And it's not to say we're going to exclude men. That's not what I'm talking about at all. I just mean, let's get to a meritocracy so yes. that, you know, women will have their shot, men will have their shot, everybody else, male, female, whatever your sexual orientation, identity, race, religion, all those, that's the essence of inclusion. But I think yeah. the, the, the foundational elements of so many organizations are not, and, and I call them elements. I mean, it's, these are all people who have made decisions. A lot of people I think are holding on tight for something out of fear. Yeah. So I think yeah. we have to get in there and help people understand we're not coming for you. That's no, why no. I'm not, it's, I'm not, it's not personal, you know? I, I, I agree. It's equal, equal. We, we want gender equality. Absolutely. And, and, and that's the thing, the higher up we rise, we should intentionally make sure that others don't have to go through the struggles we did. We need to pave the way. We need to blaze the trail. We need to make it easier for them to show up as their full selves and contribute value because the energy that they're wasting in fighting this systemic racism, the microaggressions, the stereotypes, they could be putting that energy towards achieving business outcome. And this will be good for everybody. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. That's a, a great note to begin to close on because I, I really want to hear from you. I ask this of all of my guests, and that is what advice, wisdom, you're a wise woman, or maybe even words of healing do you have given everything that's going on in the world right now? Yeah. So there is so much going on, and I do not want to discount that. Jenny, there's always, there will always be something going on. Mm -hmm. There will be situations we can't control. We can't predict. We just have to know that we can choose our responses. I have coined a term called power quotient. Mm -hmm. Just like we have IQ and EQ, we have PQ. And our power quotient is that we have the power to decide how we show up, how we behave, how we respond, no matter what the situation, mm -hmm. let's own it. Let's be the change agents. Let's opt into this leadership pipeline. We're doing this not just for ourselves. We're doing this for the generations to come. And when we do this, you know, Jenny, our mere presence becomes an inspiration. Yeah, for sure. And we will, we will achieve gender equality. We will achieve representation. We must make the most of this shot that we have been given. Mm -hmm. Let's take it. Let's make the most of it and show the world our worth. That's why the title of the book, show your worth. We are worthy. Let's show it. Oh, I'm inspired. <laughs> I'm inspired. Shelmina Babai Abji, thank you so much for being on Fifth Dimensional Leadership. You are indeed an inspiration. And uh, I'm, I'm grateful that you have sidestepped your career. You didn't retire, but you, you moved into a whole different realm to be of service to women. And I think that helps our entire civilization. So thank you for that. You're too kind, my friend. You are an inspiration for me. Thank you. <laughs> And that's our show for today. See you next time. Mm -hmm.